Okay, so our goal here is to find what number this sequence converges to. And let's start off by talking about the limit as n approaches infinity. And here I'm going to put these two powers over each other. So 5 plus n to the 100th over 4 plus n to the 100th. And then I'm going to have 5 to the nth over, and that's really 5 to the nth times 5. And it looks like here those are going to cancel each other out. And if we look at the highest power on top compared to the highest power on bottom, that's going to be dominating each other. And so notice this will go out to 1. And so after all of this, it looks like we have 1 fifth for our answer. So it's going to be answer choice A. Okay, for 32, we're given two facts about an integral of f of x and an integral about g of x, and which of the following must be true? So notice it's from a to b. So um, really, we don't know much about this or even the third one, but let's focus on the second one, because that one I have a feeling must be true, because if we're going to integrate from a to b, of f of x plus g of x, that's the same thing as the integral of f of x from a to b plus the integral from a to b of g of x. And notice that if we talk about their values, well, over that interval, f of x is going to be 5 and negative 1. So, yeah, this should be answer choice B. Okay, for our next problem, it wants to know which of the following has the same value as this. So, I did a quick sketch. I was like, well, I know sine of x from 0 to pi looks something like this. And let's see, so 0 to 2 pi. So, from 0 to pi, we have this if we're going to integrate. Now, which of the following is the same? Well, if we remember back to our pre-cal days, that uh, we can look at some kind of phase shift here with cosine, because sine and cosine are the same. It's just one is shifted pi over 2 to the right, or even left, however you want to think about it. And so, if I move this function back pi over 2, well, then I'm going to have exactly what I started with. So that's going to tell me that this has to be equal to this. So that's going to be answer choice A. Okay, this problem's a little different from your traditional related rates problem. It is still set up very similar in parts of it, and parts of it is going to be different. Um, I would still label this side as Y. If my pen would write, that would help. This would be y, and this side's going to be our x. And we still go through that same process that we would. We would set up our geometric formula. And so if we go through our formula, we're going to have x squared plus y squared equals 40. And so we have 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt equals 0. And do try to simplify here. And so x dx dt plus y dy dt equals 0. Now, we don't know normally in these problems where we know x and y's value. We know something about it. But here's all we know. But in the problem itself, um, keep in mind, it told us something. It told us that um, we're looking for the distance RQ. So I'm looking for X, RQ, at the instant when Q, so when Q is moving along the ground three-fourths as fast as P. So this is information about the rates. So we're going to replace the rates and try to find our x and y. So this problem is a little bit backwards to what we are used to working out. So let's see if we can replace our rates. So x we don't know still. 
but we know that that rate is um, three-fourths, it's moving three-fourths as fast as, um, uh, let's say our side Y is sliding down the wall, so dy dt plus, and a y, again, we still don't know what y is, and then we have, again, our dy dt. And so it looks like we can do some kind, and of course this is all equal to zero. Now it looks like we can move maybe all of the x information since that's a negative, I would add it all over to the other side and list of the equation to see what happens. So if we do that, get my pen again here. So if we do that, then we're going to have y dy dt equals 3 fourths x dy dt as we change those to be in the same information here and here, so that tells me that y equals 3 fourths x. So again, we're getting closer, but we're trying to solve for this x. Well, go back to the equation we knew with x squared. So I know 3 fourths x squared plus y squared equals, uh, let's, let's change that substitution here. Let's leave that x squared. Sorry, folks. So that was x squared plus y squared, but in place of y, let's put 3 fourths. That'd make a little more sense, wouldn't it? Equals 40 squared. Okay, so let's see if we can't solve here. Moving right along, let's see. So that's going to give us a mess, isn't it? So we have x squared here. 1x squared, and here we have 9 over 16. So if we combine those like terms, I have 25 over 16x squared equals 40 squared. And let's see, and this is non-calculator, so wouldn't be grabbing those calculators. We can do this a little bit easier, though, because we have x is going to be equal to the square root, and we have 40 squared times and then 16 over 25 and so it looks like we'll be able to simplify this out quite a bit so again let's see 40 squared so really that just means x is equal to 40 times 4 fifths isn't it and that hey that works out nice that's going to simplify down to 32 which is going to be answer choice e Okay, on this problem, we're told that if f, capital F and lowercase f, are differentiable functions such that f of x equals, and again, we have our um, notation here, and that's going to be equal to f at a is negative 2 and f at b is negative 2. And notice that a is less than b. Which of the following must be true? So, looking at this... Notice this sure does look an awful lot like we have the same endpoints. And if we do, then we know by Rolle's theorem or a mean value theorem that, and more specifically Rolle's, that this has to be true. This, so here we know this is very similar to Rolle's theorem. All right, so in this one we are integrating and we really have two different places that we're going to have to set up. Um, doing a quick sketch of this just to kind of see what's going on with it. We have um, for one and less we have y equals x so we have something like this and then we have 1 over x for values of x greater than 1 so we have something like this that's continuing on. Now we want to know, well, what is the value from 0 to e of the integral of f of x? So we will need to divide this up into two separate parts. So we need to integrate the first part from 0 to 1 of x dx. And then 
we would need to add that to the integral from 1 to e of f of x. Well, and, but what is f of x? We can go ahead and write that in of 1 over x. So when we do our integration here, we have 1 half x squared, and we're evaluating that from 0 to 1, plus, and then this other side is going to be the natural log of x, and again, evaluated from 1 to e. So the first part, we have 1 half plus, well, the natural log of e is 1, minus the natural log of 1, which is 0. So it looks like we should have 3 halves for our answer. Hey, here we have an exponential problem. And just in general, you can set up your formula so that you have 1,000 times just picking out all of the um, information times 1,200 over 1,000. And that's going to be raised to the t over 7. And notice that we want to know after 12 days. So we need to substitute in our 12. So we have 1,000 times our 1,200. And you can reduce that if you want over 1,000 raised to the 12 over 7 power. And so you should end up with answer choice C. Okay, for this one, we are actually looking for the average value. So we're given the derivative, which is our instantaneous rate of change, but we're looking for an average rate of change. So what we need to do here is integrate. And so we can go back and see, well, what was our original function? And if you need to separate to see it, that's fine. But our original function should have been the natural log of x. So I want to know, then, what is that average rate of change over the closed interval from 1 to 4? So I'm going to have the natural log of 4 times the natural log of 1 over 4 minus 1. And then the natural log of 4 minus 0 all over 3. And notice they have it written a little bit different. A big hint on how to fix this, of course, that is 1 third natural log of 4. But notice our answers, a lot of them are in the um, and our value of 2. So we need to change 4 to be 2 to some power. So that's going to be the natural log of 2 squared. And with logarithms, you can move that 2 down to the front. So that's going to give me 2 thirds natural log of 2, which is going to be answer choice C. For this problem, we have this terrible looking function here. And it wants to know at what value of x is f of x uh, at a minimum. So um, since we're talking about f of x in a minimum, we need to go look at f prime at x. And so remember in this format, you need to, when you take the derivative here, we're going to substitute in that for my exponent. So in place of t, I'm going to put x squared minus 3x, and that's going to be all squared, and then times the actual derivative there. So it's going to be times 2x minus 3. So after we do that derivative, and we can clean this up a bit, um, and then we would set this equal to 0 because you're really looking for a critical point here. So I have 2x minus 3 times e to the x squared minus 3x all squared. Now, thinking about this, e, remember, is 2.71828, all these values. And if we're raising it to an exponent, there's no way that can ever be equal to a 0 because it's too busy being the value of e. So the only way I can generate a 0 is from our 2x minus 3. So the only place we would hit a minimum value here would be when x is 3 halves. So that's going to give us answer choice C. Okay, for our next problem, which is an absolutely strange problem, we will um, be going through looking at this limit. And this will be something a little bit different. 
Now, if we went ahead and always try substituting in directly, and so that's going to be 1 plus 0 to the, well, cosecant of 0 is undefined. So we have 1 to the undefined. Well, nobody knows what the heck that is. So um, what we'll have to do, this function, it, it is continuous. So what we're going to have to do is something to move our exponent, move this maybe down to the front and work with it. And the only way we're able to do that is through a natural or logarithm, but natural log is the easiest to work with. So I'm going to do the natural log of 1 plus 2x all raised to the cosecant x. And now I know this is equal to some limit value. I just don't know what it is. So I'm going to remind myself that I did natural log here so that I know to go back and solve that whenever I get my answer. So if I do the natural log here, so that means that I have the limit as x approaches uh -oh, 0 of, and then I can move that down to the front, and so that I have cosecant, now cosecant x, and let's see, I'm going to move that natural log out, so that makes it a little bit easier, and you're welcome to do that. Cosecant times 1 plus 2x equals, and again, we still have our natural log of L sitting over here, and that's just our answer. All right, so natural log of, well, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, so that means I can take 1 plus 2x. I'm going to write that over sine of x. Okay, now, and again, that's still equal natural log of L. Well, we're still getting a mess here. We're still not getting... We're, what we need and so what we'll have to do is end up let's see if I plug in 0 and we have natural log of our 0 well then that's still undefined so we still got a mess here and we really end up with 0 over 0 so let's go talk about L'Hopital's rule so let's see if we are going to incorporate L'Hopital's rule, then we have the limit as x approaches 0. And so, let's see, if I do the derivative of the top, I get 2. If I do the derivative of the bottom, I get cosine x. And so, hey, this doesn't look so bad now. And again, let's see, we do have our natural log floating around over there. So all of this is equal to natural log of L. And so when I solve this, when I plug in, I am going to get 2 over 1, which is 2. But it was really, let's see, we have 2. And that we did take the natural log here of both sides. That's an L, not a 7. So what is L going to end up being equal to? Well, it's going to have to be e raised to the second power. So here, our value of our answer is going to be answer choice e. Hey, for some reason, um, 43 was cropped off of this slide. So I'm going to go ahead and put 43 here from our test. And 43, we wanted to know um, the coefficient of the 6 degree uh or the c or sorry the coefficient of x to the sixth in the taylor expansion about x equals zero four and we were given f of x let's see i'm going to go back and number this this is 43 for f of x equals sine of x squared so the first thing we need to do is think about, well, what is the expansion of sine of x? And the expansion of sine of x is going to be x minus, and we have x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial, and so on. 
And so what we need to do here is exchange this x value for x squared. So whenever I make that change, then we're going to see what that expansion is. So sine of x squared, we're going to have x squared minus x squared raised to the third all over 3 factorial plus um, x squared. And I think we probably have enough because we're looking for the coefficient of the term that contains x to the sixth power. So if we um, stop and look, that's going to be sitting right here, of course, negative included. And that's going to be x to the sixth over 3 factorial, which is 6. So that coefficient is going to be 1 sixth, and that was answer choice A. All right, so for number 45, we have um, a weird looking expansion. But if we write it out, because I wasn't real sure what to do with this, so if I write it out, I know k okay, starts at 1 to infinity, and we have sine squared x all raised to the k. So my terms are going to be, let's see, well, the first term here, starting at 1, is going to be sine squared x plus... And then my second term is going to be sine to the fourth x. And then the next one is going to be sine, let's see if we plug in 3, 3 times 2, 6. So it looks like here that we have some kind of geometric expansion, and really an infinite geometric, to where I keep multiplying by a sine squared. So it looks like my ratio here is equal to sine squared x. So, let's talk about, well, what would that sum be then? So the sum in our formula is going to be your first term over 1 minus your ratio. So my first term was sine squared x over 1 minus my ratio, which is sine squared x. Now, 1 minus sine squared x, if we remember our trig identities, that is, cosine squared. So notice that this sum, or this function, the sum is going to end up being, well, sine squared over cosine squared. So that's going to be, uh, let's see, f of x is going to be tangent squared x. And so it was asking, well, what is the value of f at 1? Well, the value is going to be tangent of 1 all squared. And that should give you answer choice, and I don't remember which one it was. We'll have to substitute it in and see.